Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Dan Russell, and I'm normally the guy who would give the introduction to David Woods, and I would mention his work with nuclear power plant control panels, and I would mention his studies with NASA with you know human error and failing systems and building resilient power. Yeah. I said I'm going to let him do his own introduction. Uh, but David Woods from Ohio State University, I'll tell you how. Okay. Um, uh, uh, just a little prologue to this uh, little satire, rather than a conventional, since you're not a conventional information organization. Um, I was interviewed for Japanese TV a number of years ago on aviation safety, on a near miss. And it was dubbed into Japanese. So I hid it from my students, figuring they would do terrible things to this tape, and to me. Well, this year was the 50th anniversary of the Human Factors Society, and I had been involved in the Human Factors Society, and someone wanted to put on a show of all the past presidents, which sounded like something that would get very pretentious very fast. So I pulled the old videotape. That's how old this was. Walked in and handed it to the students and said, you have a three-minute time budget. Make as much fun of me as you can. And so by introduction of who I am and what I do, we will play their, their uh, re-editing. コンピューターと人間が良い関係を結べていないのです。ほう。集中力を欠いた状態で何らかの操作を必要とされると、ミスが起こる可能性が高くなります。慣れによってだんだん考える過程を飛ばしてしまい、不注意、怠慢が生じ
The other thing we've noticed about data overload problems over the years is everyone complains about the difficulty in interpreting massive amounts, or today, hypermassive amounts of data. So when you say to them, oh, well, let's take some of that access to data away, you think they go, oh, sure, I can't interpret it all anyway. And of course, they all go, no, 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 don't take it. We worked hard. We waited for a long time to have that access to all of those forms of data. And we use them some of the time. Please help us with interpreting all of that. Um, so our work with the professionals moving away from cockpits and control rooms and operating rooms where we have tended to work. Uh, happened one day when uh, somebody came to visit me from one of these agencies a, a decade ago and said, we should work on data overload. And we said, oh, sure, we'll be happy to work on it as long as you let us work on it two generations ahead. Right? Because you were constantly being trapped in Band-Aids and repair processes. So. Um, we got involved, and we've been doing a variety of kinds of studies with professionals. So we don't go off and just ask them, how do they do it? There's a lot of books out there where a so-called uh, expert at information analysis will write a book on his own or her own psychology. We call it the psychology of intelligence or intelligence analysis. And they do their own sort of folk uh, uh, psychiatry on themselves. What we do is we go off and study how real people solve real problems. So we work with real pilots, real physicians, real professional analysts. And we do that because we obviously, in this case, have a big barrier, the wall of classification for many of these people. So we create difficult scenarios. And they're modeled on real world cases. So one of the real world cases that occurred uh, that made us think a little differently about some of the results we had been getting was the Columbia accident. How many of you have looked at the Columbia space shuttle accident how many of you looked at it in detail? How many of you read the return to flight report? How many of you have read the seven page dissent, seven or eight page dissent within the return to flight report? No one noticed the dissent. They buried it as an appendix because they didn't like some of the people saying they were doing a bad job during the return to flight decision making. Well, this is the situation. This is one of the uh, PowerPoint slides. Uh, how many of you heard Tufty's critique of PowerPoint? OK. All right. Um, so this is one of the slides he refers to in the run-up to Columbia, where someone presents this analysis. And the question I would ask you, is this a rigorous? Can you tell from the slide, is this a rigorous analysis? Or is this a shallow analysis? And? Yeah, I should. Um, and so there are a variety of things here uh, that look like someone has done a detailed assessment. Uh, there's been no changes. It mentions there's a probability that it hasn't changed. It's now safe to fly with no concerns and no added risk. It implies there has been a, an updated risk analysis. It implies there was a risk analysis. It implies that they've done a careful understanding of the boundary conditions. All right, now, most of you know that this is all fake. This was one person's opinion, all right, put on a PowerPoint slide to create a convincing argument there was nothing we needed to do. In other words, these foam events that were occurring regularly pre-Columbia didn't add safety issues, and therefore it wouldn't slow down the schedule. They were operating under faster, better, cheaper pressure. And so their concern about foam events was about how to re, um, refit the orbiter to be ready to launch again. So they were all orchestrated around schedule. And if you go through the Columbia report, um, there's a couple episodes of this where people couldn't tell that they were making decisions on a very shallow basis. So here we have some leading engineers, some highly specialized people doing a very specialized and risky task, falling into the trap of shallow analysis. Um, do you ever fall into the trap of shallow analysis? Um, anybody, um, you know, teach younger kids, right? Which is, right, if you type in a, a query and you get something that's on topic that seems to support your need to write a short paper for your teacher, then you're done. 
Um, if you ask the professional analysts, they are very, very concerned. In fact, we think that our definition of a professional analyst is someone who is, who is afraid that the analysis product they're going to create will turn out to be wrong. I mean, if they're very, very afraid of shallow the risk of shallow analysis, that's what we think makes a true professional versus the, all of us being able to grab on-topic material and quickly throw out a result. How do we tell what's rigorous? So we went back um, after the Challenger case. Oh, and by the way, any, in the return to flight descent, does anyone know the definition of rigor in the return to flight? Return to flight descent? Uh, they say uh, strict adherence to a standard. Any Bayesians here? Bayesians? What would you call a rigorous decision analysis? Following Bayes' rule. Well, some of the statisticians or the decision people, the formal decision modelers would say, rigor means you follow the rule we think applies or the algorithm that applies to that situation. Well, we decided that, that looking at the risk of shallow analysis and how would someone interpret the, whether or not an analysis was rigor was an important leverage point in improving information analysis generally, whether it's specialized for one community or, or for any kind of task that matters to people. So what we did, yeah, yeah, I will. In fact, we will show you. Uh, takes a minute. It's a big thing. So what we did was we went off and we started working with the professionals. And so what's our basic method? Create a realistic case. The, uh, oh. the launching uh, point or wedge. So our explor exploration said, how do you assess the quality of a uh, information analysis process? And how do you communicate that to the consumer of the product? So we started with this definition. And let me turn off the sound, because this is something we use as a multimedia tool. Whoops. Uh, so we started out using words that were used by professional analysts. So we just started asking them, what's a rigorous analysis? And we use synonyms for a variety of the things to say a broad disciplined exploration of alternative explorations for the findings. So that was our starting point based on knowledge elicitation studies. And this work is from Emily Patterson and Dan Zellick and a little bit of contribution from me. So that's where we started. So we said, OK, let's put this together into a into a situation. And so we created a situation we call the supervisor's dilemma. You're in charge of an information analysis shop. And you have to decide whether you, the analysis your people have done is sufficient to go forward, sufficiently rigorous. Is it ready to go forward to the consumer, decision maker, planner, replanner, the customer? So you're the, inter, you're in the interplay. And in some ways, your decision is, does it need to go back for more analysis? And what kind of investment, given that you're always under limited resources? You have limited time. You have limited uh, forms of expertise, right? limited access to different people. And if they're working on this analysis, they're probably not working on another analysis. You have opportunity costs. So we created a situation where we could do this supervisor's dilemma. Now, to do this, we had to create a case in which people had to do, could do a realistic form of analysis. So we picked an energy safety slash security case on the other side of the country. Uh, liquefied natural gas is a growing new form of energy. Basically, you can get natural gas from other parts of the world and ship it in a liquefied, cooled form. But that means you have tankers with this stuff, and they have to come into some kind of terminal. And this is particularly interesting for energy supplies in the Northeast US that doesn't have good access to alternative supplies. So liquefied natural gas is a new energy source. There are safety issues with it. Why is liquefied natural gas a safety issue? Because it has a lot of energy. If it's very efficient, 
a lot of energy. So if it gets out and ignited, it can create a very intense, very quick spreading fire under just the right conditions. So you have your classic safety stuff. So it's a great topic for analysis. You've got energy. You've got NIMBY. Not in my backyard issues. Where's the terminal going to be? You've got cascading failures, potentially. Right? So we've got a lot of different factors. And then you throw in the wild card, security. What does security do? Is it changes all the assumptions in your old safety analyses. And in fact, the adoption of liquefied natural gas slowed down because of, of security concerns, that someone would deliberately try to attack one of these tankers and create an intense big fire and secondary fires that were from the other facilities that would be engulfed. So it is a great case because it changes the whole uh, basis of your old analysis, and you have to rethink things. So the opportunity for revision, getting trapped in old ways is there. So we created a liquefied natural gas scenario. And we've been using this in a several different studies we've been doing, looking at the actual performance and behavior of analysts. Um, so there's the liquefied natural gas scenario. And then uh, we brought it together with the uh, supervisor's dilemma with a, a walkthrough process that we developed in a previous study of information analysts, which was we used it uh, elicitation by critiquing. So the situation we created for studying and getting information was to say, you're a senior analyst. You're going to critique right, a junior analyst result. Right, so we give you the product. And in this case, we'll also then give you a process. And your job is to critique it. In this context of the supervisor's dilemma, the specific decision you have to make is, is it ready to go on to the customer? If it isn't ready, what would you invest in? Right. So the, uh, the walkthrough in this case, we created two junior analyst reports. One, we worked on to create a low rigor example, but realistic analysis of the liquefied natural gas situation, energy safety slash security. Um, it's also a nice example because you can play with different perspectives from the local responders, reg energy regulators, uh, safety, uh, local government, uh, environmental, uh, energy business. And so the different perspectives makes this a nice case to use in our studies as well. So the second analysis was uh, based on one that was actually done by a security company, the former uh, counterintelligence or counterterrorism czar, Richard Clark's company did an analysis of this case for the Boston and Massachusetts. And we built on their analysis to create a, what we thought of as a high rigor example. OK, so we have a low rigor, high rigor example. The method then is you're the supervisor. You've got to make this judgment. First critiquing pass, we give you the product. The second critiquing pass, we give you a summary of the process by which the analyst created that product. So these are fict fictive junior analysts. They're not looking at them directly. They're looking at first their product, second pass their process, and they have to make judgments. And we build in a variety of probes into the situation and into the contents in order to be able to get uh, elicitate, elicit more information and be able to orchestrate the information. Now, what's interesting from this is um, a couple things. And we actually just finished the papers on this, so you can actually get uh, this topic landscape's a little bit old when we produced it, so you can, I can leave a copy of the summary of the results if you're interested in this. Um, so if you go back to Tufti's critique of, of analysis by PowerPoint, right, in some ways, this is empirical data that might support or revise or overturn some of the claims of different people in that discussion of the weaknesses of analysis by PowerPoint. So we've got some real data. Well, the first thing in the findings is, is that in the first pass, people made a judgment about was it rigorous enough based on just the product information. And we got some of the cues they used. What was interesting is once they got the process information, they changed their mind about what was rigorous. So knowing the details of how you got to the end result mattered. And if we went into the details, some of those the issues become important in terms of revealing or making observable the analytic process in supporting a judgment of rigor. What are some of the things they would be looking for? Well, we're going to come back to this with a new definition of rigor or shallowness, low rigor versus high rigor, deep versus shallow analysis. 
Uh, so a good, a simple example would be the breadth of exploration of alternative interpretations. Did they generate alternative interpretations? Did they explore them? Another would be critiquing. Did they show it to other, other uh, peers or other groups who would have an opportunity to comment on or critique the, ana the analysis results of the junior analyst? So they were relating to some of these cues, and I'll, I'll, I'll integrate those findings in the, in the new model, the multi-attribute model of rigor, shallow versus deep. Um, we also had a big surprise, which is after they saw the product, some of the six of the nine analysts were ready to send it on. I believe that's the correct number. Once they saw the process, none of the analysts, none of the, the, the supervisor, people acting in the supervisor's role, were ready to send on the anal either of the analytical reports. Once they saw the process, they decided neither were ready, which surprised us, because we had worked extremely hard all right, to try to make these both realistic and different in level of rigor. So there was a, a simple example would be the low rigor involved a much smaller set of documents that were examined in order to, as a base for the analysis. And there was a much broader exploration of document sources, documentary sources for the high rigor example. But in the end, they said that both of them were, uh, were inadequate to go forward. And that was a surprise to us. And then we went back and reanalyzed our anal our, our, the, the, uh, the, the fake analyses we did. And I'll show you those results in a minute. So let's jump back into this issue of what's rigor. Um, What we're trying to do here is we went back through this study, other studies we had done, and some other groups, including the down the road at Park, who are also looking at information analysts and how they do things. And we started to pull all of these things together and say we identified eight different kinds of attributes that would fold into a meta judgment about the rigor of an analysis. And um, so let's run through some of these indicators of these dimensions and how they play into assessing what's high or low rigor. So here's the dimensions. Information synthesis, what's that? Well, a low rigor report, let me jump in here to, I think it's this one. So information synthesis, so we have examples here. Uh, low uh, synthesis would be data reporting, fact reporting. Here's a collection of facts, right? Uh, reading the news is sometimes said by the professionals, all right? Uh, or are you starting to add some level of insight that goes beyond a simple compilation of apparently relevant information, all right? And then uh, was it reconsidered from diverse points of views and maybe leading to a reconceptualization? Explanation critiquing is another category, all right? So at low explanation critiquing, we would come back and say, uh, I just did my job. I threw together an analysis within my resource and expertise base, and it's up to other people in the organization to see if they're going to critique it or uh, comment on it. Um, a medium level would be I went and showed it to one of my peers to do a quick check on my chain of reasoning or story construction, and they might critique or augment the process. Think of this like a physician with a hall side con uh, hallway consultation when they run into one of their physician partners in their, in their service. And a high would be a series of reputable peers and specialists carefully examining this, uh, identifying inferences that might be wrong. What's an example of this? The Columbia Accident Investigation Board. They didn't just form a reputable panel. Right? The reputable panel had diverse backgrounds related to the accident, but they convened a series of symposia and brought in a series of consultants, myself being one of them, to check their reasoning and logic, expand on it, reinterpret it. So here you have a high rigor examination in the context of the uh, Colombian accident investigation. Um, we can go around, hypothesis exploration. All right, so this is the how broadly do we generate and search and evaluate multiple explanations. Uh, low is I, I quickly generate a favored hypothesis 
And this tends to lead us to look for certain kinds of fixation or what Paul Feltovich calls knowledge shields. These are shields you put up to prevent discrepant evidence from revising or changing your story. All right, so this has been much studied. We've studied it a lot over the years, how people get trapped in a single hypothesis. All right, um, here we start to consider others, but we don't have a balanced interpretation uh, versus we have a process that's carefully considered and weighted the different, the different uh, uh, possibilities. And often that returns to the issue of did you generate new possibilities from the examination of, of, of the initial possibilities. So the hypothesis generation process is important. Uh, we can keep going around uh, the, the actual search process. <clears throat> Did we quickly find something on topic? In my information analysis class, I give people, in fact, while I'm here, they're working on this back in Ohio, I give them a surprise in the history of intelligence analysis. Right? And I give them a seed article on it. And then uh, tomorrow, uh, when the uh, co-teacher does the exercise, the first exercise isn't, why did the surprise happen? They, the first thing is to say, what other sources did you, did you consult? And I guarantee you that several people will say, I went to Wikipedia and looked up that accident. And it seemed like that what you said in this article was correct, so I just used the article you gave us. Obviously, you gave us the article for a reason. Right? And then somebody else will say, I Googled it. I Googled the accident. I Googled Yom Kippur War or Yom Kippur War Surprise. And I'll come back and I, I'll look at the first page. Right? These are graduate students. I guarantee you two or three will have done this. They'll look at the first page. They'll click on a couple. They'll say, oh, the information's consistent with what you gave us. I'll just read the chapter you gave us. Um, right? I mean, it's about a 15-page chapter. Even for graduate students, that's their quota for at least a week these days, all right, in actual text form, right, as opposed to multiple Facebook interactions. Uh, you know, that's why we're moving to multimedia resource sets here with video clips and things, because we don't find people read anymore. So writing a long paper on this is only for me to, to uh, support people with grayer beards than I have who still want to evaluate professors by academic publications. Um, and, uh, and then you'll get somebody who will go, wait a minute, this is in the defense, this is military history, and they'll go look it up in a military history guide like Jane's, all right? And they'll go, yep, you gave us a good source, and they'll still read the one chapter. <laughs> all right. And so that's the information search kind of issue. Um, one of the things we've seen, even with professional analysts, is they will often simply funnel down on a relevant set of material that's manageable for the resource window they have. And they will then adopt a few of those as key resources in the analysis. And of course, if those turn out not to be complete, accurate assessments of the events in question, their, uh, their uh, explanations or projections about the future will turn out to have flaws in them. And again, we have empirical studies with professionals who have 10 to 20 years experience indicating these traps of shallow analysis can get any of us, not just high school students. Um, notice the difficulty in the information search. And to some degree, it's a difficulty the whole shallow versus deep, low versus high rigor problem has. And it comes up particularly here. How do you know, how do you get a sense whether you're going to find stuff? Because if you already knew what to ask for or to look for, you would have already included it in your search. So there's this sense of, have I really looked for other material? And would anything be promising if I put extra effort in? Mm -hmm. This means that our, one of the risks we're worried about is premature closure. And the concept that we originally came up with was in observing expert analysts was they usually include some kind of broadening check. They have some kind of heuristic they use to look a little far further afield, to look an extra time, to generate a different topic or a different twist on the search in order to reduce the risk of getting trapped in too narrow a set of resources to build their case, their explanation or projection. We can keep going around. Uh, information validation. Uh, this refers to what the analysts usually talk about, the conflict and cooperation process. Right? 
did you just accept a report um, in the liquefied natural gas? Is it easily ignited? Some sources will say it's easily ignited. Others will say it's hard to ignite. Mm -hmm. That's a vague interpretation. How do you push behind that? Did you identify conflicts? Like there are sources that from the industry which say it's hard to ignite, and they're from environmental groups which say it's easy to ignite. And how do you notice that conflict and then pursue that to get some cooperation or better technical detail? Um, uh, I found one that does, sounds good. The issue here is sort of a suspicious attitude. Remember I said I think our, our, our working definition of a professional is one who's afraid they're going to give you the wrong answer in their information analysis. And that comes out very much here in the validation. Very much a, suspic a suspicious attitude. And the, uh, the journeyman or new professional analysts who come into these organizations often end up doing a kind of cut and paste where they find on-topic materials, cut and paste them together to create a kind of composite storyline. But you don't see the active, what they think of as the analysis process is, how do you detect conflicts? How do you find corroborating sources to build confidence? Hmm. Uh, stance analysis. Remember I said in the liquefied natural gas example, as you work through the analysis, there's multiple groups that are relevant to it. And they have different stances. There's the obvious energy company versus environmental group, which we tend to think of as, as opposing stances. Uh, but a national perspective right, can be quite different than a local responder perspective. A uh, regulatory perspective can be different than uh, the business perspective. And so what are the stance of different sources? Right, and why would they emphasize certain things? So the, the uh, Sandia lab safety analysis is based mostly on old fault trees, right? which tends to say it's a very safe form of energy transportation. What? What's the problem? Security issues change the fault paths. And can they get out of the old mindset and sort of see new ignition sources, new ways that things could spread, new ways that things could go wrong in these situations? Um, so stance analysis refers to, are you understanding the perspective and background? If you get a source that, you know, for example, an environmental source that opposes every energy development that's carbon-based, right, well, then it's not much inf there's not much information if they oppose this. Mm -hmm. So you'd be looking for variations against the stance. Uh, an example in international affairs is, uh, what does a leader from another part of the world say in English? versus what do they say in their native language. And a stance analysis would look at the difference between what they were saying in the different languages to the different communities in order to understand their actual position. Uh, sensitivity analysis. This refers to a lot of the things we do in mathematical studies uh, and simulations and analytical codes. A lot of times they're used for sensitivity analysis. Basically, in the... Uh, that what the professionals do is they look at, if they're high rigor on this, what they do is they look to say, if something is wrong in the base for my story, will the story fall apart? Right? If one, of the key, if one fact is key and the whole story hinges on that one fact being true, right, I don't have a very rigorous analysis. It's, got, it's poor on a sensitivity dimension. Right, so I'm looking for an analysis that's robust because there's always uncertainty in the core underlying facts and interpretations. Um, uh, specialist collaboration. Uh, this is something that NASA is expert on normally. It didn't happen in Columbia, which is one of the mysteries why it never got to mission control. Uh, because Mission Control is, fa in fact, an expert organization at doing specialist collaboration. Remember the front room you see on TV? Those aren't the real operators. Those are the supervisors. Each person in the front room right, is in charge of a back room. And each back room is potentially connected to specialist people all over the world who have expert knowledge on detailed aspects of the processes and components of a space shuttle and the payload and the mission planning. So specialist collaboration is how do I get the right kind of expertise and bring it to bear given the situation I'm dealing with? 
often information analysts are thought, or think of themselves as kind of generalists. And the generalist, the mark of a good generalist is knowing how to get the right specialist and integrate the specialist knowledge in the overall interpretation. So here we've gone through eight categories that try to take this thing and say, what's the definition of a shallow versus a deep or a rigor, low rigor versus a high rigor analysis? Now, what's interesting here is notice we're not saying adherence to a particular ideal process. We're not coming back and saying you should do it in a particular way mathematically. There's a particular decision analysis process. There's a specific cognitive psychological process that should be followed to do good information analysis, in part because information analysis is such a broad and diverse set of activities in so many different technical and human areas. We can vary in purposes, context, resources, access to expertise, and so it seems to have a, quite a different set of flavors. In fact, if you ask the professional analysts, what are they always saying to each other? Oh, my analysis is different than your analysis, right? Well, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I do country studies, you know, and you'll come back and say, but I, I actually come up with a plan to what to do next. And somebody else will say, but I look at healthcare. And somebody else will say, but I look at financial information. And each area, just like Boeing versus Airbus in, in cockpits, emphasizes the detailed differences of their special home base of information analysis, rather than looking for the general underlying commonalities as a form of work. So we think that the rigor multi-attribute metric gives us a mechanism by which we can quickly score and understand our portfolio of information analyses. What are we doing? Are we tending to be shallow? All right. Are we over-investing? Could come up in some places. Let's take a place where this matters to you, well, probably not for 15 years, most of you, and that's healthcare. One of the studies we're doing right now is we're analyzing accident reports, adverse events in healthcare. And what we think we're going to find when we finish the study is that most of the adverse event analyses done in healthcare to try to avoid injuring you in the process of giving you healthcare when you need it are, in fact, highly shallow analyses. When you compare, uh, does anybody remember the Duke transplant death? At exactly the same month as the Columbia accident, Jessica Santillian died in Duke Hospital due to a botched liver um, heart, heart lung transplant. It was multi-organ transplant, uh, which, by the way, means at least two other people, unnamed people, died because they tried to transplant her again. And given the lack of organs, that means two other people waited longer on the list and didn't get organs. So at least three people died in that event. The accident report for Columbia involved a prestigious committee orchestrating a year's worth of intense resources uh, around the world, high rigor on almost all of these dimensions. Jessica Santillian case, we had press releases vetted by the lawyers for Duke University hospitals. Right? The opposing position was uh, news, uh, newsman's reports trying to get behind the veil of secrecy, the wall of protection. <laughs> that was being put up by the hospital. Well, it was this one, one small mistake. And it wasn't really a bad person who did it. And so in one case, we have a very shallow analysis with low confidence the organization learned and changed. In the other case, we have a very deep analysis, but a very expensive one. What do we come back to? The fact that in information analysis, making this judgment of, is it sufficiently rigorous? Am I done? Can I stop? Should I keep going? Is a constant background decision, at least implicitly in all information analysis. Not only is it, an, is it a critical decision in information analysis, it's really an iterative decision. right? Because as we're going through this, we're constantly assessing, have we, do we have sufficient rigor? Right? And if we don't have sufficient rigor, it's acting to guide us into looking at other kinds of sources, getting other kinds of critiques, integrating other kinds of specialist knowledge. In fact, a good information analysis should help us always ask, answer the question, if I had a little more time, expertise, or money, what would I do with it? That's one of the kinds of broadening checks 
right, that would help us avoid the error of prematurely closing an analysis in a place where we would be incomplete or inaccurate in our explanation or projection of future events. So let's look at how we did. Um, in the study, we set up two fictive junior analysts with a low rigor and a high rigor case. After the study, when we were surprised that we, that was harder to do than we had thought, we went back, used this. This was the third revision of our, of our rigor multi-attribute metric. And we, um, we went back and based on the results, what we were told by the analysts in the study, we went back and rescored the two in this metric form. So this is the uh, low. And interestingly enough, the low one, in order to make it realistic, we had actually made it high on one dimension. And it was medium on a couple others in order for it to be a realistically meaningful case and not just a cartoon of a, of a, of a professional analyst analysis. Here's the one we thought was a high rigor process. If you notice, it's mostly medium, right? With one high, they saw a lot more documents in this process. But one, in the end, in terms of giving indicators of a broad hypothesis exploration and generation, it actually was pretty low based on what the analysts had told us about it. So all of a sudden, we can look back and say, here's an example of how this provides us a quick graphic kind of metric that we could compile and say, where are we, given the kind of analysis that we do? In many situations, remember the question, sufficient rigor, may be, may be answered with a relatively low rigor process, because it's fairly easy to come up with an on-topic definitive answer, or that a answer that is just uh, what's a good enough answer has very low consequences relative to resource expenditure. Or we may find that in some cases, being high on only one aspect of this is critical, again, given the nature of the resource to criticality of the analysis. So this gives you a tool that's context sensitive. It doesn't impose and say, this is the right answer. It allows you to assess what are your information analyses looking like, and are they appropriately matched to the context of the decisions you have to support? Yes? Uh, with these two scenarios, on any dimension, I could see how one process could be compared to another. Um, but I'm not so clear how you could rate a process on an absolute scale with any of these. Um, that's right. So we're doing these relative. And that's why we used as anchors, if I go back, for the uh, scaling process that we're working on, we use these kinds of anchors, um, which are based on example statements from actual analysts from different studies we've done. So if you ask the analysts to describe their process, all right, if we have a relatively low one on the synthesis, these are the kinds of statements we would see. And these are some of the kinds of indicators, if you looked at the process they went through. You would see lots of lists. Um, you would see lots of facts being taken in isolation rather than embedded in a, in a narrative structure. So we're trying to build up a set of cues that you could actually use as a pragmatic tool. So for example, one of our plans now is to go back to NASA safety, uh, 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 Space Shuttle Safety Group and come back and say, we could compile a set of these indicators that would work for you to monitor your own al analyses and make a uh, organizationally uh, specific commitment as to what level of rigor is appropriate, what should trigger additional investigation. Because remember, again, pre-Columbia, the foam events, all right, the problem was pre-existing conclusions were supported by an individual orchestrating a set of facts instead of an engineering analysis process, safety analysis process, which would examine the evidence to come to a conclusion. We can now go back and say, OK, what's Tufti's comment? In some ways, Tufti's comment, um, uh, by the way, I forgot to mention, in one of the two processes, we used a, a figure 
we used graphics, and one had no graphics. And of course, the one with graphics, the graphics attracted a lot of attention in the, uh, the senior analyst acting as supervisor, making the supervisor's judgment uh, as a cue to perhaps a more rigorous process. So what, come, what is Tufti's real remark? Tufti's real remark is that, of course, the representation of the process will influence the confidence you have in basing a decision on the results of that process. We can either right, trick people, as in the Columbia case, where someone had a conclusion they wanted to support. Nothing is different. It's not a safety issue. And therefore, it doesn't require delays and extra work. Okay. Or we can right, orchestrate the image of the analysis to make the process observable so that someone can see into critical aspects of the analytic process that are related to a more effective analysis, a more trustworthy, a higher confidence, a more rigorous analysis. The, uh, Making that process observable, interestingly enough, in the example we've used by making it observable relative to these eight dimensions, so these eight attributes, right, doesn't, doesn't lock you in, but instead forces you to debate what is good analysis for your purposes and the role of your particular analysis shop or activity. So that you can start to come back and that you can change over time your answer to what defines low, medium, or high as a relative process tailored to your context. Images, we've always known that representations can change the evaluation of the underlying information. It's so old, I call it a yand. Yet another demonstration of something we've shown over and over and over again. The representation effect, how you represent something, influences the cognitive processing to use that interpretation to do cognitive work. Is, a, is as old a finding as there is cognitive psychology. Right? So Tufti's critique is really reminding us of that and suggesting that we need to go back all right, and re-examine how do we reveal or make observable the analytic process without having someone repeat the analytic process and deciding to base a decision on it. Remember what Tufti says, and think about the rigor metric. Tufti says, we should give them a report what do you think the answer from a professional analyst is when Tufti says that? I barely get a minute or two with some of these people. Right? Or if I don't impress them in the beginning that I have something critical to their decisions, they've moved on to the next, the next briefing, the next document, the next slide, the next topic, the next plan. I have a very brief window, given the nature of this in, in many of the, certainly the geopolitical, but also in companies and executives. And I would suggest that the rigor analysis is a way to balance, and the supervisor's dilemma is a way to balance that interaction between analysis and decision making, or we, we prefer to call it replanning. You have an analysis perspective and a replanning perspective. And the rigor metric starts to tell you about how are you balancing what you're doing in analysis relative to supporting replanning judgments without getting trapped in giving them long technical reports and turning them into an ana analyst when they want to be a policymaker or planner. Uh, on the other hand, avoiding the mistake where the planner makes a decision without understanding the basis for the analytical recommendations, as in the pre Columbia judgments about the foam events being no threat to safety. So we would suggest to you that the rigor metric is a, a basis that we could explore with you a variety of kinds of applications, just as we can use this with some of the security-oriented shops. We can also use it as a basis for what's a rigorous enough safety analysis. How would we use this in various kinds of debates about energy development around the country? We can use it in, in, uh, in the NASA context of managing critical missions. Right? So we think this has a fair power of generality, and it can be customized to specific settings, and becomes, again, a learning tool that can be updated and changed as new information comes in. So uh, that's the kind of stuff we wanted to tell you about, about the current state of our information analysis work. I would also comment, uh, if there's questions, I'm happy. If people want to discuss some things, 
Um, I would mention that these studies by uh, Dan Zellick and Emily Patterson are part of the Institute for Collaborative Innovation we run every summer, uh, where we uh, launch interdisciplinary teams of people at varying educational levels uh, with a diagnosis of some of the aspects that make information analysis hard. Uh, examples would be updating or stale information was uh, used one summer. Uh, uh, last summer was the question of how do you tell whether an analysis is rigorous or not. Uh, we also look at how do you build collaborations across different analysts so one analyst can take advantage of another analyst's work without getting trapped in that analyst perspective or result. So we take a variety of diagnoses like this, we launch interdisciplinary teams, and we put on a show 10 weeks later where the show is to demonstrate promising directions to solve that problem. And by show, we mean more like a, uh, a art show, uh, where, or performance art, where we're trying to stimulate the audience. So we bring in people from a variety of analytic uh, customers and organizations that do analysis professionally, and we use it as a way to stimulate debate, interchange, uh, reconceptualization of their own work in information analysis. Uh, so thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you have anything to say about how you decide when you've done enough, or is there a way to get higher rigor, you know, better, faster, cheaper, or is that just not a good idea? <laughs> um, one of the things we're very worried about is the issue that lies in the Columbia example, that it's just long and expensive to get a high rigor, and if you spend a lot of time and money, you will have a high rigor result. Um, and so we're looking at a variety of poor, uh, a, a good resource for us is a variety of poor accident analyses. Uh, so we're looking at uh, a, radio, a radiological event in Scotland that had a very elaborate, long-winded uh, accident analysis that's not very good. As an example of something that spent a lot of time and money, but wasn't very rigorous relative to these dimensions. So we're exploring the sensitivity of the rigor metric to discriminate the quality or the depth of the analysis independent of the easy correlates. They spent a lot of time, they spent a lot of money, they had a lot of people on it. Um, on the other hand, uh, certainly a shallow, it's hard to do a more than a very shallow analysis if you don't spend some resources. So our view is this is a tool to calibrate your resource expenditures to this context you work in. And the answer will be different for different shops. So a, a space shuttle mission might be very different than someone making uh, investment decisions. Though if it's your money that's being invested, I think it might be about as critical as if you were on the shuttle, right? Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the other issue we bring up in this is, is that there are other criteria that go beyond this to decide whether or not you've made a, the right resource investment. Uh, so our recommendation to safety organizations is to have a balanced portfolio, right? If you don't have some highly rigorous analyses, you're probably not learning as much as you could or should to prevent events, bad events from occurring. If you're all relatively shallow or if they're all shallow and, and high in the same, on the same dimensions, you're at increased risk of missing cues that could have warned you about early signs of trouble or, or partial events that might be indicators of full-blown accidents and disasters that might be ahead. So our view is it's a tool in that sort of cost-benefit resource investment versus learning uh, decision that every organization has to make. This tool doesn't help you make that learning investment trade-off, but I think it's a, a critical tool in an organization making that trade-off. Yeah. So, um, I suppose you wanted to say something to companies like Google. We're not solving this entire problem, and I don't think we have anything to say about things like stance analysis or explanation critique, but we're certainly contributing to you the problem of solution. What would you like us to do differently to make it things to have effect? Well, uh, you create the opportunity for information analysis by people who have less experience. So the issue is, can we orchestrate the tools and the artifacts they would use and the methods they would use to encourage people to do a broader set of, of uh, explorations, a higher rigor? So we do have suggestions for you. All right, and 
Uh, one of these is something we're working on, which I wasn't really going to talk about. Uh, but one of the examples that come up from this is a kind of diversity search. And so we're playing around with different definitions of what would be, how would you do a diversity search where you're trying to identify that from different, different perspectives would define relevance to your topic differently. And therefore, you would come back and now have a, here are a couple different interpretations of the query. And people, by sampling from those different stacks or lists, high relevant, because they're still only going to sample a couple things at the top. We know people are going to be trying to minimize effort, right? And as they try to minimize effort, we're trying to make sure they get a broader, or at least the possibility of a broader return of different perspectives. So that would play into the hypothesis generation, hypothesis exploration. It may also lead them to expand the search and to do a little more validation, because they start to see that they might start recognizing something's in conflict. So several of these dimensions might naturally get better if we could come up with mechanisms that would implement a kind of uh, diversity, or what we've been calling it is tuned diversity search, because we're tuning it to the nature of the query and the underlying topic and purpose. And the question is, can we build that into search tools, or do we need other kinds of information about the purpose of a search in order to do this kind of diversity mapping that would encourage a broader, uh, uh, a broader exploration? Um, the other side of this is, uh, I think whether we like it or not, and I'm an old fogey, I, you know, truth in advertising, right? No hiding it here, gray beard. Um, you know, I'm in shock every day uh, from my high schooler at home who does a quick Google search on her homework, finds on topic material and is done to graduate students in, uh, in, you know, who are going to be professionals dealing with usability and cognitive, uh, uh, cognitive decision support systems and stuff, how easy it is for everybody because we have so much access to stop too early and to not use discipline mechanisms to broaden the search. <laughs> the, by the way, the professional analyst organizations tell us they have the same concern about their new hires, that their new hires fair amount of experience intellectually and academically. The difference between them and a, and a seasoned an analyst is the new person, is, they're not new in age, they're not new in academic or topical experience, uh, but what they are is way overconfident that what they initially find is a complete basis to build an, a, a reasonable and acceptable story and projection for the topic they're assigned. And they're constantly worried that these guys are, and ladies are prematurely closing and have, have inappropriate confidence. They're overconfident that they have a good analysis and they're insensitive to some of the cues that would tell them they have a, they're in danger of a shallow analysis. So at all levels, I think the danger of shallow versus deep analysis is the side effect of the easy access to massive quantities of data. You were on? Oh. Last question. Okay, real quick. So I guess um, you know, these are like nuclear disasters and stuff like that, but typically there's a cost involved in, in things. And if the cost for your high, school, high schooler who needs to turn in that paper, the cost of being wrong may not be so great in some cases, right? And right. So the, the, is there any basis to figuring the cost of being wrong one way or the other way? Well, that, first off, we think that's the point of using these. You can use these tailored to the consequences in your context. Right? Now, for the, for the student, I think there's a different consequence, which is if you learn shallow analysis techniques, you'll always be satisfied with shallow analysis down the road. So there's a different consequence with respect to do you do get an A or a C on your paper uh, relative to this being a general form of literacy for the public. Um, but the second thing is, one of the, this is one of the comments we always get about our research. Right, right, which is, well, you talk about planes falling from the sky and things going wrong in the operating room. I don't deal with high consequence things like that. Well, what, what do you mean? Wait a minute. Consequences are in the eye. The seriousness of the consequences are in the eyes of the beholder. If it's your investment portfolio that goes down the tubes when the financial landscape changes because people reacted to the trends too slowly, that's your house fund. In California, right? That's a pretty serious thing. Uh, it's you know, it's the you know, I'm just past the college uh, the college investment, but it would have been the college uh, savings for the kids. Uh, it could be that you know, under the under some of the political initiatives, it could be your retirement. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, those are pretty serious consequences to people, and they go to great lengths, and they get very mad. I mean, look at people when they have to write a, tax, a check for taxes at this time of the year. They're not happy campers when things don't work out. So I think the, the, the issue, I think it becomes easy to study when there are very high direct consequences. It's very easy right, to show people that, that, that these things make a difference. But I think the results apply across the board. They just get scaled a little differently in terms of the total resources to the total consequences. I'll be happy to stay and talk to other people, too, if we need to. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you.